So the afternoon session, the chairman is going to be Ivan. So please start. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Matthias Wilhelm. He will speak about different aspects of uh, form factors. So please, Matthias. Thank you very much. And uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for bringing us uh, here together. It's really fantastic to be able to interact in person again after such a long time behind screens. So as mentioned, I'm going to talk about form factors and how we can study them from different perspectives. One is the integrability perspective. This is based on a series of works with Amit Serve and Alexander Tumanov, who is somewhere here also in the audience, over there. And uh, another perspective is from a symbol bootstrap, so perturbatively but going to eight loop orders. And there we also observed a new and quite surprising duality between these form factors and amplitudes. And this is based on work with Lance Dixon, Andrew McLeod, as well as Umer Gurduan. So let me start with a quick introduction of why we should in general be interested in form factors. Now, one quantity that has been studied intensely in n equals four, but in fact in any quantum field theory, is the scattering amplitude of elementary particles. It is defined by overlapping the vacuum with an n particle outgoing state. Now, another quantity that has been much studied in n equals four which is important in particular in conformal field theories is this correlation function of gauge invariant local composite operators, which we define by taking the product of such operators, OI, at positions XI, and batching the result between two vacua. This has been studied, of course, from the integrability perspective in the last two decades uh, for two-point functions, three-point functions, and more recently also four-point functions. Now, the form factor of such a local composite operator is defined by acting with the operator at position x on the vacuum and overlapping the results with an n particle outgoing on shell state. Now, after Fourier transforming the position of the operator to a momentum q, this momentum q does no longer necessarily square to zero in contrast to the on shell momenta pi. So in this sense, form factors form a bridge between the purely on-shell scattering amplitudes and the purely off-shell correlation functions. Now, moreover, due to momentum conservation, the n on-shell momenta don't add up to zero, but to the off-shell momentum q, and the operator itself is a color singlet Thus, the planar form factor has the topology of a cylinder, not of a disk. Now, after this general motivation, let me argue that there's a particular operator whose form factor is especially interesting to study. Now, if you look at the LHC, the dominant production mechanism for Higgs bosons, is by fusing two gluons from opposite protons in a top quark loop, and in the process also further gluons can be produced. Now in the physically relevant limit where the top mass is much bigger than the Higgs mass, this amplitude can be described in the framework of effective field theory via the form factor of the trace of the self-dual part of the field strength squared. So this form factor, the form factor of this operator, is what I'm going to talk about during the rest of my talk. And in the maximally supersymmetric Young-Mills theory, this here is in the same supermultiplet as the famous 20 prime operator, which is another reason why this might be a natural starting point for studying form factors. Already at tree level, this form factor shows some uh, really nice simplicity. It has some MHV scattering uh, formula, which is um, 
looking almost identical to the n-gluon scattering amplitude given by the Park-Taylor formula. Moreover, if we are looking at the three-gluon form factor, there's a certain principle of maximal transcendentality at work. Concretely, it was observed that the two-loop remainder function in planar n equals 4 agrees with the maximally transcendental part of its counterpart in QCD. So, in this sense, we can really obtain part of the full answer in QCD by studying n equals 4 super Young Mills theory. So next, I'm going to tell you how we can calculate these form factors at any value of the planar coupling in an expansion around the multicollinear limit. Afterwards, I'm going to tell you how for three gluons, so this first part is about n gluons, we can then also bootstrap this quantity perturbatively using the symbol up to n uh, up to eight loop orders now for generic kinematics, whereas this is for the multicollinear limit. And finally, I'm going to tell you about this new duality relating this three gluon form factor to the six gluon amplitude. At the heart of the integrability approach to form factors and amplitudes at finite coupling is the duality between these quantities and Wilson loops. Now, if we have a set of momenta pi, we can define dual coordinates, which already appeared in Florian's talk this morning, by requiring that the difference of xi plus 1 and xi is pi. Now, for amplitudes, here illustrated for the six gluon amplitude, we then obtain a Wilson loop with edges pi and corners xi. Now, for amplitudes, the onshore momenta add up to zero. So, after n steps, we obtain the same dual point again, which is to say we have a closed null polygonal Wilson loop. For form factors, however, the n onshore momenta add up to the offshore momenta of uh, the Higgs or the operator. So we don't add up at the same position, but at a position shifted by Q. And since the conformal symmetry here can, in general, transform also the periodicity constraints, a more dual conformally invariant way to write this is to say that x of i plus n is p of xi. Now, the dual description in terms of Wilson loops comes with a physical picture of some flux tube stretching between two opposite edges of this Wilson loop. Moreover, this was the basis for the pentagon operator product expansion which describes the closed Wilson loop and thus the amplitude at any Toft coupling in the near collinear limit. Our idea was thus to develop a similar operator product expansion for form factors and equally describe them at any value of the Toft coupling. Now, the starting point is that we decompose this n-sided periodic Wilson loop in terms of a uh, number of two, uh, n minus 2 pentagons and this two-sided periodic Wilson loop. The idea behind the form factor operator product expansion is that we start now with the vacuum state of the flux tube, which propagates on this top square, and then it experiences a pentagon transition that transitions it to a first excited state, psi 1, which propagates on the next square, is experiencing another pentagon transition, and so on, until the final state here, the n minus second state, is absorbed by the two-sided 
periodic Wilson loop in what we call the form factor transition. Now, this is very analogous to the usual operator product expansion for local composite operators. You can think of the pentagon transitions here as three-point functions or structure constants. And then the form factor transition would correspond to a one-point function of the operator in the presence of a defect, something that some of us have also studied using integrability in past years. Now let, you, let me give you some more details. These Wilson loops themselves have divergences, concretely UV divergences, associated to the cusps. And these are, of course, dual to the IR divergences on the amplitude or form factor side. Now, one way to obtain a finite quantity is to consider a certain ratio where we take this n-sided periodic Wilson loop and we divide by the two-sided one and the pentagons, and then we have to multiply in again the squares in which these two um, pairwise overlap. Now, each of these squares is invariant under three abelian symmetries, which we can parametrize via taus, sigmas, and phis. And we can moreover then use these to parametrize the geometry of this Wilson loop. So for two squares arising from an overlap of pentagons, we can simply use the same parametrization that was developed for amplitudes. So here, tau, sigma, and phi are just different ways to write the usual dual conformal cross ratios u1, u2, u3. For the lowest square, the one arising from overlapping the pentagon with a two-sided Wilson loop, we can moreover build these two combinations, these two dual conformal cross ratios, using the three points here and their periodic images under uh, this operation P. Now, in a conformal frame where P is just a shift, these become perfect squares now. And the third one one might expect from amplitudes is actually zero here. So now we are able to make the main statement of the operator product expansion for form factors, which is that this particular ratio of Wilson loops is given by a sum over all states of this GKP flux tube. And the sum contains a sequence of pentagon transitions and ending in a form factor transition. Moreover, there is an exponent here associated to the propagation on each of the squares, which, in addition to the geometry, contains the flux tube energy, momentum, and angular momentum. Now, these three quantities are known at any value of the coupling, thanks to work by Benjamin. And moreover, also the pentagon transitions are known at any value of the coupling. So that only leaves us to determine one building block, namely this form factor transition. And we will also be able to get this at any value of the coupling. Now, this quantity is universal in the sense that it only depends on which operator we are looking at, but not whether we are looking at a three-point or 300-point form factor. So before going to the details how we can determine this form factor transition, let me briefly recap integrability for the GKP flux tube, or rather begin with the integrability of gauge environment local composite operators. Now, as everybody at this conference, or at least most people at this conference, have probably heard of, the problem of determining the spectrum of these gauge environment local composite operators or their scaling dimensions can be mapped 
to an integrable spin chain and the spectral problem there. And this can famously be solved via beta ansatz techniques. So we can get these energies at any value of the coupling. Now what we can also do is include a lot of covariant derivatives between any of these two fields here. And if we are then taking the limit where we take infinitely many covariant derivatives, we get a situation where we have a Wilson line along which these fields or excitations are now inserted at finite differences. Now in this limit, both the scaling dimension and the twist go to infinity, uh, and the, I should say, and the spin go to infinity. But the twist, the difference between the two, stays finite. And we can interpret it as the energy of the flux tube state. Now for a state with n such excitations, the total energy is simply the sum of the energies of the individual excitations. More generally, such a GKP eigenstate is parametrized by the number of excitations n, their species a, so whether they are fermions or gluons or, field st uh, or um, scalars. And moreover, we have uh, their beta rapidities. So you can think of the beta rapidities as being kind of the momenta of the excitations. Then the form factor transition is defined as the vacuum expectation value of this Wilson loop with a state inserted on this edge divided by the same Wilson loop without the excitation inserted. Now from this definition, a couple of non-trivial properties follow that this form factor transition has to satisfy. And indeed, we can use these properties, which we call axioms, to bootstrap this missing ingredient, the form factor transition, at finite value of the coupling. The first of these axioms is a property of this two-sided periodic Wilson loop. Namely, it is invariant under rotations along this uh, transfer plane called uh, U1 phi transformations. And it's also invariant under asymmetry rotations. And as a consequence, also the form factor transition has to be a U1 cross SU4 singlet. Now, if we look at the charges of the fundamental excitations of the GKP flux tube here, we see that they are all charged under U1 cross SU4. So as a trivial consequence, the two-sided periodic Wilson loop cannot absorb single effect, um, fundamental single particle excitations. And with a bit more of work, one can show that it can, in fact, only absorb states that are built from conjugate pairs, phi, phi bar, summed over i, and similarly, fermion, antifermion, summed over the flavor, as well as the gluon, antigluon, here also optionally with some covariant derivatives leading to so-called bound states. And in addition to these pairs, we can also have products of pairs. Now, at the practical level, this means that the form factor transitions are a bit harder to determine than the pentagon transitions, which could really absorb these individual excitations. The remaining axioms, 2 to 5, are possible to depict quite easily. The first of them is the Watson axiom. And this is really a property of the GKP states. If we exchange two of these excitations, we pay the S matrix. The second property is, again, a property from this two-sided periodic Wilson loop. And that's a Z2 symmetry. We can just look at it from the other side. That 
changes the ordering of the excitations and puts a minus sign in front of the rapidities, but doesn't change any of the physics. The third property is related to what happens if the rapidity of the first and the last excitation becomes similar. In position space, this can, for example, happen if the two here become very close to each other at opposite sides of this edge. Now, in this case, they, in fact, decouple, and we obtain a square transition times a form factor transition of the remaining excitations. The last axiom is called crossing symmetry. And this is telling us that if we are applying two mirror transformations here to the first excitation, we obtain the form factor transition where it is in the last position. And recall that the mirror symmetry here sends the energy to I times the uh, momentum and vice versa. Now, from this, we can find a simple solution at finite coupling for the pair of fermion antifermion and the gluon antigluon pair with the um, also bound states here included. And this simple solution is just given by the inverse measure times a delta function in the rapidities. So the inverse measure is forced on us essentially via the square limit here. It's the square transition. Now for the scalars, we weren't able to immediately write down as simple as uh, this a solution. So what we did instead was to solve these axioms order by order at weak coupling. And there we also enjoyed a fruitful interplay between the integrability-based description and this simple bootstrap, which I'm going to talk about next. The founding principle behind this um, uh, interplay is that the loop expansion of these two sides doesn't really line up perfectly. Instead, if we have the result for the form factor transition on one side at a given loop order, this allows us to reach the next loop order at the symbol bootstrap, which then in turn allows us to reach the next loop order for the form factor transition, a bit like these funny letters with alternating smokes. So playing this game for a couple of rounds, we were able to guess now the finite coupling description also for the form factor transition. And here recall that the pentagon transition for uh, two conjugate scalars is given by a tree-level value, that's a ratio of gamma functions, times uh, exponential of some source terms that are evolved with the BES kernel. Now, what we found for the form factor transition was a similar expression with a tree-level value given by a ratio of gamma functions, but now the source terms in the exponential are really evolved with an octagon kernel. Now, the 1, 1 element of the octagon kernel, uh, the octagon anomalous dimension, of course, of course, for the octagon, which gives it its name, but also for the origin of the six-point amplitude. Now, at this moment, we don't know uh, really why this kernel occurs in these different contexts. Maybe there's something deeper about it, but maybe it's just n equals 4 super young Mills theory being lazy. Now, using this solution, we find a perfect match with a perturbative data up to 8 loop order, but also with a minimal coupling solution to the axioms at strong coupling. So far, I talked about the two particle form factor transitions. Now let's go to two n particles. As we already heard um, previously, an important property of integrability is factorized scattering. So for example, the spin chain 3 to 3 scattering matrix is given by a product 
of the spin chain 2 to 2 scattering matrices. In a similar way, also the pentagon transition for n particles can be factored. And we also found that the form factor transitions for 2n particles can be built from a factorized ansatz. For example, if we have the form factor transition of a gluon, fermion, antifermion, and antigluon, this is just the product of the one for the fermion, uh, for the fermion, fermion, antifermion, and gluon, antigluon. Now, we have worked these out explicitly uh, for everything involving just four excitations. For a higher number of excitations, there's still a matrix part that's independent of the coupling, though, to be worked out. Now, let me switch gears and tell you about the simple bootstrap where we are able to now determine the three gluon form factor for general kinematics up to eight loop orders. And if you got lost in the previous part, now is also a good part to rejoin. So to do this, we need to have a bit of an understanding of what functions occur in quantum field theory. And at one loop order, these are poorly logarithms. So for example, in two dimensions, uh, the one loop bubble evaluates to a logarithm, and the one loop box integral in four dimensions evaluates to uh, sum of dialogues in the product of logs. Recall that this classical poorly logarithm is defined recursively by integrating the one of weight n minus 1 with this simple integration kernel dt divided by t. And then this recursion starts with the monolog, which is just minus the logarithm of uh, 1 minus the argument. Now, more generally, we also have these multiple poly logarithms occur, where in addition to this kernel dt divided by t, and the kernel dt divided by 1 minus t, we also have these general kernels dt divided by t minus a occur. Now, as uh, Florian has already told us earlier today, quantum field theory does not stop at these functions, but uh, there's infinitely many more classes of functions which also involve um, elliptic curves or integrals over Calabi-Yau manifolds. And uh, if you go to four dimensions, um, then this is a Calabi-Yau um, L minus one fold. So there's a slight difference uh, to the first talk um, due to the different dimension. And this is really a full scattering amplitude. The only contribution to a particular uh, component scattering amplitude in n equals four or in the fishnet theory so it also occurs in n equals 4. We just don't see it if we are naively looking at the Pentagon OPE, because that is a sum representation. For the purpose of this talk, the multiple poly logarithms will suffice, though. They are also called Gonshoff poly logarithms and first occurred prominently in the n equals 4 or scattering amplitudes literature in this uh, two-loop six-gluon remainder function. And the remainder function is just an alternative finite part of the amplitude, alternative to this ratio of Wilson loops uh, mentioned earlier. Now, the result that was found for this quantity fills 18 pages. And if you have very, very good eyes, you can see that it's written in terms of individual Gonshoff poly logarithms. Now, when Spreden, Vergu, and Volovich saw this result, they asked Gontroff what to make out of it. And Gontroff told them a trick by which these 18 pages can be actually written in just two lines. And if I were to give the definitions for this L4 and the J here, that would just add two more lines. The trick that Gontroff told them is called the symbol. And it is defined via the total derivative. 
So the total derivative of such a Gontroff pulley logarithm of weight n can be expressed as a sum of Gontroff pulley logarithms of weight n minus 1 times uh, d log of phi i, where phi i is now a rational or more generally algebraic function of the momenta. Then the symbol of this function is recursively defined as a sum of the symbol of these lower weight functions tends a, a logarithm. Now to give you an example, we can look at the dilogarithm. Its total derivative is just minus the logarithm of 1 minus x times the d log of x. So the symbol of this function is just minus the logarithm of 1 minus x tensor log of x. Now the symbol itself here is a tensor product, so it's multilinear and thus easy to manipulate. Moreover, the entries of this tensor product are logarithms which satisfy log a, b equals log a plus log b. So that makes the symbol and via it the multiple poorly logarithms easy to manipulate and very well understood. If you want, the idea is to decompose these complicated functions into simple functions in the same way that we can do compose a Lego model in terms of individual building blocks. Amazingly, this idea can also be reversed and we can use these simple functions to build complicated functions. And this goes under the name of bootstrap or simple bootstrap. The idea is to make an ansatz for the result in terms of pulley logarithms via the symbol and then to fix the coefficients in this ansatz via physical constraints. In this way it's possible to avoid Feynman diagrams and Feynman integrals altogether. Let's look at the example of the three gluon form factor. So here looking at the two loop result we see that the building blocks these uh, log of phi i are now given by log of ui or log of 1 minus ui where u1 is uh, just s12 uh, the Mandelstam variable divided by q the momentum of the operator or Higgs squared and via momentum conservation these three add up to one, so only two of them are linear independent in the same way that phi was zero in the Wilson loop. Now, for the Wilson loop, we use this ratio of Wilson loops W3 to obtain a finite quantity. Here, it's advantageous to use a slightly different normalization, the so-called BDS-like normalization because this one here breaks cyclic invariance and we can restore the cyclic invariance if we multiply the, by the exponential of the cusp anomalous dimension times this product of logarithms. Now the starting point is a tensor product at L loops in these six letters of length 2L so if you approach it naively, this is a 6 to the 2L dimensional vector space. So you have to do just linear algebra to fix the coefficients. And the way we are doing this is by imposing physical constraints. And the first one is essentially Bose symmetry. This um, three gluon form factor is invariant under any permutation of the three gluons and thus also of these three combinations of their momenta. The second requirement is a purely mathematical one. We know that partial derivatives commute and the symbol is defined via the total derivative, but this is not necessarily a property of everything in this tensor product, so there's a non-trivial constraint coming um, for something to be actually the symbol of a function. The third constraint is 
physical again, and it is that the branch cuts of the form factor have to start at Sij equals zero, which is the threshold for particle production in a massless theory. Now, if we look at the letters here, this one has indeed a branch cut um, for the argument being zero, as we know from the logarithm. But here, this one uh, would also have something for uh, this being one, which it shouldn't. So only log of ui can occur in the first slot of this tensor product, not log 1 minus ui. Similarly, we also observe, looking at the two-loop data, that the last entry can only consist of these three linear combinations of the total six entries. And then if we uh, further look at the data, we find more and more such constraints at one loop order, which we then impose at the next loop order. Finally, via integrability, we know, of course, the near collinear limit, which imposes more and more, in fact, infinitely many constraints that allow us to single out a unique solution and impose, still using the remaining constraints, infinitely many cross-checks on it. In this way, we have found new results at uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 loop order, which is a new record for uh, this bootstrap. Now, in particular, this is really expected to give a part of the result for Higgs physics at the LHC. Now, before concluding, let me also mention this new duality, which is, to be 100% concrete, between the cosmically and BDS normalized quantities for the three gluon MHV form factor and the six gluon amplitude. So concretely, we can obtain this three gluon form factor if we take a six gluon amplitude and we replace the uh, dual conformal cross ratios here by simple functions of the form factor kinematics. And moreover, we apply this antipode map, which is part of the Hopf algebra structure of multiple pulley logarithms. At the simple level, the, Hopf, the antipode map just reverses the order of these letters of the entries in this tensor product. However, the antipode is also defined at the level of functions and uh, also for uh, numbers, but they are modulo i pi. Now, something really strange about this duality is that it relates completely different physical properties on the two sides. For example, the first entry encodes the discontinuities of one side, and via the reversal of the order with the antipode, this is related to the last entry, which is encoding the derivatives. Also, through this duality between Wilson loops and form factors and amplitudes, this antipodal duality also implies some duality between the periodic and closed Wilson loops. Now we've checked this duality up to seven loops, so it's true beyond a doubt, but we still have no physical motivation of why it should even exist. Now let me conclude. In this talk, I've told you about the operator product expansion for form factors based on the dual periodic Wilson loops, which allowed us to determine these form factors in a near collinear expansion at any value of the coupling by bootstrapping the one missing building block, this form factor transition. At the same time, this allowed us also to bootstrap via the symbol now at general kinematics but perturbatively up to eight loop order, 
the three to one uh, form factor. And this is in particular expected to give part of the res full result for Higgs physics at the LHC. Moreover, we observed a surprising duality uh, between the three gluon form factor and the six gluon amplitude here, which is quite mysterious. These form factor transitions, which we bootstrapped, still have one detail to be worked out, namely this coupling independent matrix part, which uh, would be interesting to work on in the future. And so far, I've only talked about MHV, but I'm happy to report that uh, since last week, actually, also NMHV works. And here we also looked only at the simplest operator, this um, self-dual part of the field strength squared, which is also in the same supermultiplet as the 20 prime. But it would also be interesting to look at further operators, both from the integrability as well as from the bootstrap perspective. Finally, it would be very interesting to find a mathematical or physical derivation of this new antipodal duality as well as a generalization of it, which is something else we're currently working on. At this point, let me stop and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matthias, for the nice talk. So are there any questions? Hello? Hello? So when you said uh, there is a duality between the three gluon, uh, three gluon form factor and six gluon amplitude, is it, I guess, for some particular operator? Or how general that is? And if you change the operator, how much will it change and so on? Uh, that's a very good question. So what we um, looked here was really this uh, operator, which is um, the 20 prime or the one that's really relevant for uh, the Higgs amplitude. But uh, it would be interesting to see um, whether there's a similar duality also for other operators. But then we would first need to work this out. Um, so uh, this uh, antipodal duality is not just due to the fact that you've got the same variables in the game and then somehow the space of functions is simply restricted to be what it is? Could you repeat the question? Um, okay, I was maybe too far away. Uh, so this antipodal duality is uh, to a good extent probably related to the fact that uh, you have got the same variables more or less. No? There are three cross ratios in this amplitude and there are how many variables on... Uh, so there's uh, two variables for the form factor. So if you are making this uh, replacement here, this is actually bringing oh, right, you right, to right, a right. two-dimensional uh, subspace. So this is the subspace, if you know these variables, um, related to uh, delta equals 0. So usually also the alphabet um, uh, here has nine letters. Here it has six letters. And if you know the notation, these by letters, these odd um, letters, they um, uh, vanish under this replacement. So here you're really on the parity even subspace. Right, so if the amplitude classification of the functions is unique in some sense, I mean, did, can, can you find something else under this identification? Sorry, the, I'm... Can, can you find something else if the amplitude space of uh, functions is unique? I mean, as an explanation for the, uh, uh, for the antipodal duality, is it not just that uh, you're forced to fall on, on the same things? So I find it hard, hard to understand you. So the question is whether uh, there's a unique solution uh, on this side or this side, or 
Well, I mean, in the amplitude, you pretty much know from the work of uh, Dix and Vermont and whoever else. Uh, so George was in that and whoever yeah. contributed what the functions are. Yes, So exactly. as long as you can identify that, like, uh, could you have found something else for the, for the form factor? So uh, a different uh, duality, I mean, if you, if you have a good suspicion, um, then uh, of course you can uh, look for something, but this match here is highly non-trivial. I mean, if you look at our eight loop results here, this has uh, 1.8 billion terms, and the coefficients of um, all terms match. Uh, this one is only uh, known up to seven loops, so it's slightly less than a billion uh, terms at seven loops, but it's highly non-trivial that this works even at the level of um, the symbol. And then oh, it works also for um, uh, numbers. If you go to particular limits, you have got multiple zeta values, so it also works there. So if you have a good guess, then there's plenty of data to check um, whether it works. But uh, yeah, we are currently trying to go to more gluons. And um, I guess we don't have a good guess there yet. Oh, right, OK, thanks. Uh, I mean, so there's plenty of space to get wrong. One other thing. Um, you say uh, this is what you need for the LHC, but this is an n equals 4 calculation, I understand. It's a yeah, so usually um, you don't have this um, principle of maximal transcendentality uh, for amplitudes in n equals 4, but this was this amazing um, uh, result uh, that um, uh, the Queen Mary group found that for this particular operator, um, there was the QCD calculation done, and uh, the n equals 4 calculation then done uh, by these three. And they found that really this maximal transcendental part agrees. So this is the leading order in this um, uh, particular limit, but also for the subleading order, uh, interestingly, um, the two theories give the same piece at maximal transcendentality. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, I have a question. So, uh, very nice talk. Thank I was wondering um, regarding this antipodal map, is it something you can formulate at the, at the level of the OP in the collinear limit? Or? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, uh, I think it boils down to um, the fact that uh, we are really using this antipodal duality, which is at the level of multiple pulley logarithms. Uh, so it's manifest at the symbol, uh, but uh, then if it's actually about numerics, it works only mod um, i pi so far. So if you were able to see the symbol of the OPE uh, and ignore i pi, then this would be possible, but I don't know um, of a way. Similarly, for both quantities, there's a strong coupling description in terms of um, uh, volume of this minimal surface, but Currently, we have no notion of um, what uh, this volume mod i pi uh, should be. So um, until uh, we fix uh, this i pi, if it's at all possible to fix it, uh, we cannot make any numeric uh, or OPE uh, or minimal surface statements. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. I have two questions. Thank you. One, yep. why did you stop at eight loops? Could you not do better? The computer was not big enough, or there is other? So uh, nine loops is currently uh, running uh, okay. on the cluster. So uh, the thing is, integration is hard. And we are able, with this bootstrap, to reduce uh, integration to uh, linear algebra. Mm -hmm. But if your matrices are uh, sufficiently big, OK, you can play some tricks, like uh, finite fields, which is what you're doing. But still, uh, at some point, uh, even uh, linear algebra uh, crashes your kernel and requires you to go to a cluster with a lot of RAM. I see. The second question is, this antipodal map has some like, physical intuition for it. So you're changing the first and the last letter. Can I understand this is some amplitude, some weird limit, or some different, uh, like, I'd infrared. love to learn about any physical intuition okay. um, behind this. So, th I mean, it's a limit in the sense of, um, I mean, you're going to the parity even um, uh, subspace. Uh, 
mm -hmm. or you could say it's a like twisted forward limit where um, now for the sixth momenta, uh, the fourth momenta is minus the first one, the fifth is minus the second one, and uh, so on. Uh, but I mean, all of this could be red herrings until we are able to find the second example of this duality. And we're working on that, but um, yeah, it's a work in progress. Thank you. So it seems that there are no many, no more questions. No? Okay, let's thank again to Matthias for this very nice talk. Thank you.